Hello. Welcome all. Uh, I want to, you know, this is a, one of the, uh, we had similar uh, occasion uh, a few months back and then uh, now I'm very happy to see a lot of faces there and uh, uh, welcome once again to all the audience. Uh, and uh, the next is I welcome uh, Tim. Uh, he's uh, instrumental in uh, making this happen. He talked to all these people and then uh, get them on the board. And uh, he worked hard for this uh, to happen. Uh, welcome, Tim. Uh, Tim is our uh, moderator. He does an excellent job. And, and uh, we are uh, just waiting for this. Uh, and then uh, I want to welcome the panelists. This is one of the greatest uh, panelists we had uh, quite some time. And then I want to welcome Reverend Nathan Paris and then uh, Reverend uh, Amy Anderson and uh, Imam Carl Lut Williams and then Rabbi Andrew Elian. Yeah. Thanks for uh, uh, coming over and then uh, uh, I welcome once again, and then uh, Wanda. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Oh boy, that's a that's a rough start. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. There you go. Welcome to the Human Relations Commission's I Have a Question About Religious Extremism. We're very excited to have you here tonight. And as the night goes on, there'll be other people trickling in. They've told us some people have said they'll be late, which is OK, because everyone is encouraged to participate in this conversation. I Have a Question About is actually a series that the Human Relations Commission has been doing now for quite some time, a few years now. We've had I Have a Question About Christianity. We've had, I have a question about Judaism. We've had, um, I have a question about Islam. And tonight is, I have a question about religious extremism. And so this series is actually a series that falls under the Interfaith Committee of the Human Relations Commission. And the chairperson of our Interfaith Committee you just heard from, Mr. Manjan Shramana. And so as he stated, um, Mr. Tim Amon, who is also a Human Relations Commissioner and also sits on the Interfaith Committee, has really taken the, taken the helm for organizing tonight's meeting. And so what we're wanting to do tonight is to really encourage you to ask questions about religious extremism. And as we all know, here in our community, we have been seeing and hearing about little things going on, some little things, some kind of big things that have been going on over the past several years. And of course, nationally, we hear about a lot of religious in intolerance and bigotry and extremism when it comes to just about every religion imaginable. And I was just speaking with someone earlier and I was telling him that I think that what happens is for a lot of us, when we don't understand something, we make it up. I mean, that's just being perfectly frank. And that's how stereotypes get started. That's how misunderstandings get started. That's how misinformation gets distributed out in our community. And that does nothing but divide us as a community. We are trying to be proactive here in Winston-Salem in that we want to bring people together. We want people to ask those hard questions. We want everyone to be able to get a clear understanding of what the different religions are all about. But even with this dysfunctional side, when we're talking about extremism, what is it that causes extremism? What is it that makes a Christian person or a Jewish person or a Muslim person just kind of go over just, just cross that line just ever so slightly into going into acts of violence and terrorism and so on and so forth. And so we want to discuss those really hard questions tonight. We hope to, to bring some insights to you, but you know we're not going to have all the answers. But at least we can encourage that fruitful discussion. So anyway, as a part of the Human Relations Commission's mission, what we are charged with doing is having those hard discussions with our community. In addition, what we do is we investigate civil rights violations on behalf of city government. Most of those civil rights violations that we investigate involve housing discrimination, uh, things that violate the Fair Housing Act. And we also mediate landlord-tenant complaints. And of course, we have three boards that we administer, and all three boards are represented tonight. 
the Human Relations Commission. Commissioners, if you're in the, in the audience, would you please stand? Any Human Relations Commissioners? We administer the College Advisory Board. Anyone here from the College Advisory Board, please stand. And we also administer the Youth Advisory Council. Anyone here from YAC, please stand. <laughs> so we do work with our community in a number of ways. Outreach is a big part of what we do. So again, without further ado, please participate. You have index cards for those questions you may want to submit to the panel. I'll have staff going around, grabbing index cards, bringing them up here to our moderator, Mr. Tim Allman, and human relations staff also. Could you please stand? <clears throat> so any of these people will grab the cards from you and they will bring them up here so that we can have your questions asked. Also, I'd like to thank the Winston-Salem Police Department for being here. They are here just to make sure we're all comfortable and nothing gets too out of hand. And so that's the only reason we have them here. But we do want to encourage that safe place, that safe place for having this tough conversation. So again, welcome everyone. And I'd like to turn the floor over now to Commissioner Tim Amon, who also represents Wake Forest University as his chaplain and tonight's moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda, and uh, thank you to each of the panelists for taking some time out of uh, a very busy day to be here and to assist us in this conversation and to the audience um, for being here as, as well. Uh, shalom, salam, and peace to each of us. As we gather here this evening uh, to explore uh, tonight's topic entitled, I have a question about religious extremism. Uh, until recently, um, people in the United States didn't talk or think about religious diversity. But 14 years after 9-11, North Americans are finally gaining a sense of urgency about the need for interfaith conversation and interfaith cooperation. Now, the Winston-Salem Human uh, Relations Commission is sponsoring tonight's panel discussion because we recognize that if we don't engage religious diversity, if we don't bring people from different religious and philosophical traditions together, if we don't inquire, acquire positive knowledge and appreciative knowledge of other people's traditions, then, uh, in the words of Ibu, Ibu Patel, the founder of the Interfaith Youth Corps, we forfeit the territory to those who are happy to build barriers and to tell lies. We also believe um, that a big part of what the 21st century will be about is whether religious difference um, will be a cause of isolation, and we certainly have seen examples of that, um, will be a barrier to substantive conversations about things that actually matter to each of us, um, will be a source of religious violence or a bridge of cooperation, which is what we're, what we're hungering and thirsting for. We've had a robust multicultural conversation for at least a generation, but it is almost always about race or gender or ethnicity, and appropriately so. But now we are recognizing that if we don't create safe spaces for people from different religious and philosophical backgrounds to come together to build understanding and cooperation, then again, we surrender those conversations to those who are more than happy uh, to build barriers and to spread misinformation. Closer to home, the Southern Poverty Law Center estimates that the number of hate groups in the United States has grown by 60% since the year 2000. And most recently, 20% of attacks were motivated by the religion of the victim, compared um, to the 47% that were racially motivated. People of faith do uh, need to do more than simply condemn <clears throat> those attacks. We have to um, respond, address to the root causes of violent and nonviolent uh, religious extremism as it presents itself not only in our own community but around the world. And so tonight we have this extraordinary opportunity to participate, I think, in a deeper conversation about 
combating religious hate and extremism in our public circles. Another reason I think that we're gathering here this evening is that we need a new knowledge base, a new set of competencies on literacies. We need to have, and I said this earlier, an appreciative knowledge of, the, uh, of other traditions that exist within our community. We need to be able to identify shared values across our various traditions. What does Islam, or, or how does Islam speak to compassion, as an example? How do Jews speak to mercy? How does Christianity speak to forgiveness? And you can do that with topics like the love of neighbor, or environmental sustainability, or uh, systemic poverty. These are our shared values. And lastly, we need to develop a new skill set, all towards the end of creating safe spaces where people from different faiths, from different philosophical worldviews can come together and build understanding and figure out ways to cooperate around those shared values. An example of that would be, are we able to tell our own stories of religious extremism and hate speech? Are we willing to listen to other stories? And are we able to speak with people from different religious and philosophical viewpoints in a way that they can actually trust us in those conversations? And are we able to organize programs in our mosques and in our temples, in our parishes, in our churches, uh, in a way that bring us, bring us together? Since September 11, 2001, the international community has dedicated significant energy and resources to curtailing religious extremism um, around the world. And policymakers in Washington have generally viewed religious extremist movements through a national security lens as a hostile and violent reaction to the West. Consequently, and this is no surprise to anyone, the responses have been primarily militarized and security oriented. Uh, in a world that is racked with violence, and I can just speak from my own tradition as a, as a Christian minister, the words blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God, is not only challenging, but it is also daunting. As a Christian, I believe that the hardest saying of Jesus, and perhaps the most controversial in a post-9-11 world, is indeed love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. I also believe that the issues that we will discuss this evening with the help of our panelists and with your help are, are not partisan politics. And there are no easy answers to the complicated questions that we will discuss um, around religious extremism and national security. I would also challenge us that uh, no one in this room, and frankly no one in our community and our world has a monopoly on the truth, although some perhaps would argue that point with me. But I do believe that there is reason to worry about the increasingly religious tone in formulating an aggressive foreign policy in response to the religious extremism that is spreading in, into the mainstream throughout the Middle East, in Northern Africa, and in countries with significant Muslim populations. I am convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that embedded within each of the religious traditions that are represented um, here around this table is a warning against the demonization of perceived enemies and the assumption that those who fundamentally question American domestic and foreign policies must be siding with the extremists. My Christian faith challenges the simplistic idea that the world has been divided into the forces of absolute good and absolute evil. Perhaps it is more complicated than that. And that's part of the reason that we're here. Why are we having the conversation? Well, part of the reason that we're doing this is because a recent Pew Research Center survey suggested that a majority of people now living in the United States are very concerned about the rise of religious extremism around the world. And a somewhat smaller majority of people are also concerned about the possibility of rising religious extremism in the United States. And so I'll close with my opening remarks with these words from Ibu Patel, who said this, studies have shown that Americans say that their knowledge of Islam and Buddhism is about the same, but their attitudes toward Buddhism are far more positive than their attitudes toward Islam 
even though they report the same level of knowledge. And Eboo says, why is that? And he says, I think the answer is simple. Because when we think of Buddhism, the face that comes to mind is the Dalai Lama. And when people think of Islam, the face that comes to mind is Osama bin Laden. So tonight, we are committed to creating, I think, new images, to telling other stories, to telling our stories, and to reminding ourselves anew, perhaps, that storytelling is not just about sharing your own story repeatedly. It's also about an exchange of stories between people who see the world through a different set of lenses. So it is your job and my job to do a whole lot of listening tonight. And why is that, why is that important? Because our panelists are not only communicating information to you, but they're also communicating emotion and intent. And so our task is to actively listen for these as well. So um, I want to offer some ground rules for, for the evening. And they're pretty simple. In just a few minutes, I'm going to ask our panelists to take up to five minutes to make an individual presentation. And again, this is really about storytelling more than an academic pursuit. Um, and so um, when that is finished, hopefully while you're listening to them, you'll be writing down your questions. And uh, when you have a question, raise your hand, and, and some, uh, some member of the staff will come by and pick those up and bring those to, to me. You may direct a question to one of our panelists, if you would like, or you may, excuse me, direct that question to the entire, uh, to the entire panel. If you need another card, just simply raise your, uh, raise your hand. Um, again, we will not be receiving questions from the audience. We simply ask you to write those on a card and submit them. Lastly, and, and most importantly, and let me just preface this by saying we're actually trying to model healthy conversation around religious difference. We need good examples of that. And so we need to do that for each other and for everyone else who may be paying attention to this conversation. So the last thing I would say as a ground rule is this, that the Human Relations Commission is committed to providing a learning environment in which the worth and dignity of all persons is affirmed and where everyone is treated with civility and with respect. And my hope is that our conversation tonight will hopefully reflect that, that commitment. The last thing I want to do before we hear from our panelists is that I want to offer us a working definition of religious extremism. Now let me just say that this is one definition among many. And my guess is that our panelists and, and probably you as well could come up with their own definition. But we'll let this sort of be our place of departure. This definition comes from the International Civil Society Action Network, and they define religious extremism this way. Religious extremism is defined as rigid interpretations of religion that are forced upon others using social and economic coercion, laws, intolerance, or violence. I'm going to repeat that again because I, I see my colleagues up here writing vigorously. <laughs> Religious extremism is defined as rigid interpretations of religion that are forced upon others using social or economic coercion, laws, intolerance, or violence. There's only one more sentence here. It is accompanied by non-fluid definitions of culture, religion, nationality, ethnicity, or sect, which move citizens into exclusionary, patriarchal, and intolerant communities. I realize that's a mouthful, but that's a good way to get us, get us started. So what I'd like to do is um, give you an opportunity to hear from our panelists, and we are going to follow the order, um, much to Nathan Parrish's chagrin, as it is stated 
um, um, on your order for the evening. <laughs> so, um, Nathan? Sure. Well, first of all, let me say uh, thank you for the invitation to be here tonight and to participate uh, with my colleagues here and with you uh, who joined us for this uh, opportunity to have this conversation. Uh, it is an honor to participate in a public event like this, and I hope when we leave here tonight, we'll all be glad that, uh, that we've been together and that uh, we'll leave having learned some things from each other. I think a good place for me to begin is just uh, with a, a story, as Tim was suggesting. So much of um, our experience is, is best shared in stories. So <clears throat> I currently pastor uh, Peace Haven Baptist Church in Winston-Salem, but I grew up in eastern North Carolina in a very small town east of Raleigh. And in that small town of probably less than 3,000 people, religious uh, pluralism looked like the Baptists and the Methodists uh, sharing quarterly uh, worship services and exchanges. So that's kind of um, a, a place of, of thinking about how our lives can often begin in a very um, uh, small uh, place in terms of the sets of experiences that are available. Uh, it's not negative or bad, it just simply was the way it was and how they evolve and change over time as our relationships and our sets of experiences also broaden and change. And thankfully, I will say, mine have. And so I have been brought into communities and into relationships that have uh, deepened and challenged and, and caused me to reflect more about not only the faith uh, commitments of other people, but about my own faith commitment in relationship to those um, persons of other faith who share life with me uh, in, in my community. Now, as the pastor of my church, uh, the story I would share would be that Back in 2010, I became aware of something I should have probably already intuitively known, and that was that um, in Winston-Salem, um, the Muslim community here had been experiencing uh, pain and had been experiencing um, incidents of uh, hostility uh, post 9-11. Um, to be honest, and I'm not really proud of this, uh, even though I knew uh, Imam Griggs as a friend, I had not really thought much about the effect of those events on the community, but I did become aware of that, and so uh, at that time, I was in relationship with several other clergy in the community, and we decided that we needed to act in a way that was uh, supportive of the community uh, at the mosque, and that also set a tone in our community of Winston-Salem for a different type of religious engagement. Now, one of the things that came out of that was an interfaith prayer service that was conducted at the mosque on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. It was attended by more than 200 people here in Winston-Salem. It was quite a, um, a fascinating and fruitful thing to arise out of those engagements. In my own congregation, one of the things I put together was a statement, and I would share it here as kind of my opening thing, and I invited people in our church to voluntarily sign this uh, statement reflective of our commitment at Peace Haven and as Baptist people. And it, and it reads in, like this. From our origins in England under the direction of John Smith and Thomas Helwes to our birth in America under the leadership of Roger Williams in the state of Rhode Island, Baptists have been a people who champion religious liberty, not mere religious toleration for all people. Baptists believe in freedom of religion, freedom for religion, and freedom from religion. Baptists ground a commitment to religious liberty for all people in the belief that all human beings are capable of responding to God in a conviction that God alone is the Lord of the conscience and on the principle that religious liberty as well as the free exercise of faith commitment is a right and not a concession. The command to love our neighbor demands that we stand with and for our neighbors. Loving our neighbor includes standing with and for 
others on challenges related to religious liberty and the free exercise of faith commitment. Therefore, as a member and friend of Peace Haven Baptist Church, and this was what people were asked to sign, I reaffirm my commitment to religious liberty for all people and insist upon this freedom not only for my faith community, but also for all other faith communities. I stand in absolute opposition to incidents of hateful rhetoric and hurtful actions directed at the Muslim community specifically or any other community of faith. And finally, I'm committed to shaping a community where cooperation replaces contentiousness, where understanding replaces ignorance, and where friendship banishes fear. In good Baptist fashion, we ask people to sign that voluntarily. And uh, we had uh, about 50 uh, households, um, either individual persons from households or households as a whole, uh, sign that statement and present it as an act of uh, commitment in worship. Um, what we're seeking to do um, is to stand by the deepest uh, convictions that are a part of our own heritage. And that includes uh, especially religious liberty, not only for ourselves, but for others. So uh, thank you for the time to be here uh, tonight, and I look forward to the uh, questions that we'll have a chance to share together. Thank you. I certainly want to thank Nathan for those remarks, and he's one of those persons that really works hard to put it into practice. So we appreciate that. Um, my perspective and approach to this subject, um, I don't think we can isolate the history of violence and domination in terms of the inception of this country. We spend too much time ignoring the pain, the violence that's been thrust upon uh, particularly um, people of color, uh, whether it's African Americans who were snatched from Africa and forced into slavery, then had to endure over 100 years almost of apartheid. Same thing with Native Americans, Hispanics, um, Asians. So we have a history of oppression and domination. And oftentimes, we skip over that. We don't want to deal with that. and. The truth, as I see it is, um, and understand it, is that um, out of that it's formed an ideology that is still pervasive uh, today. Um, and I should include women in that um, history of oppression as well. And um, it's sort of like a dialectic or a pendulum that swings from left to right, right to left, depending on the circumstances. And much of what we have, which, much of what we know about the history of violence and domination in this country and, the, and, and in the world, but I can only speak particularly of America, we see it flare up uh, from time to time. And right now we're seeing it flaring up again. So when we talk about extremism, there's always been a form of extremism as it relates to religion, race, uh, gender, you know, et cetera, class uh, in this country, going all the way back to the pilgrims, the witch hunts, and all of that, um, those kinds of um, insane experiences. Um, and we see how it formed into uh, ideology that's been pervasive through the years. And the lack of criticism, the lack of um, analysis and criticism of that ideology and history only leaves the door open for more of the same to happen. And until I think we really get real about telling the real story uh, of America and, um, and, and, and begin to question um, that, that it's ideology, ideological base. Um, we're just really spinning 
our wills. While I'm, pre I'm very grateful uh, to be here tonight and to participate in this, but this is certainly uh, not new. And, um, and I think we have to really meet and get involved with people of color and poor white folk who are affected by both the ideology and the history of violence uh, in this country. Um, the other thing that um, I think is important in critiquing um, this American ideological base is a matter of paradigm. It's a matter of world view. For instance, we just automatically accept um, that um, America is an exception. We accept that America is, is different from everybody else in the world, except when you talk to people who have been victimized by Americanism um, uh, in recent events. I'm not going to go through all that right now. Um, you know, so there's this um, ignoring of a re sense of reality. But when I talk about paradigm, um, I'm referring to the worldview in America, the Western worldview, as I sh uh, should really call it, the Western worldview is predicated on a kind of rugged individualism um, that sees himself, herself being detached from the larger community and, and the world. It's, it's predicated on uh, maleness, on uh, class and domination uh, uh, that uh, pretty much responsible for so much of the oppression that we see going on. And I can be specific later. Um, but there is another perspective that's based on the interrelatedness of all life. Um, Native Americans, African worldview, uh, Latino worldview, worldview, et cetera, is predicated on the interrelatedness of all life. So that Dr. King used to say, I can't be what I ought to be until you become what you ought to be. And when you have a worldview that, that, that I think becomes the foundation of understanding community, um, then I think we can begin to move towards that and the recognition of the value and worth of, of the human personality. We, on, on the other hand, if we continue to follow the path of Western thinking predicated on this individualism, um, then we're not talking about community. We're just talking about I pull myself up by my own bootstraps you have to do the same, and we fail to see the interrelatedness uh, with each other. And the last thing what I want to say is that the struggle for democracy is still ongoing. Um, and we have to learn how to be dialogical um, and be able to engage in dialogue without trying to win, but really trying to, I think, understand each other, work with each other. and to um, address the other's pain and suffering and when they are under attack by either racist, sexist, or classist, um, ideology, et cetera. Thank you for, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'd like to say that I'm very grateful to be here tonight and this is for me is a privilege and as well as an opportunity to share my experience with you. 47 years ago, I arrived in this country to, to Forsyth County, actually to Kernersville, with three expressions and three dollars. The expressions was good morning, good afternoon, and I'm hungry. <laughs> and uh, I arrived in here really came in trying to escape persecution. And I will tell you very briefly. I born in Peru, South America, and my mother, while was expecting me, she was converted from Catholicism to uh, being an evangelical. Well, in my country, is the official religion is Catholicism. And uh, less than 5% right now, is they are Protestants, but mostly they are Catholics. Well, since I was the first child born 
into the family and I was not baptized in the Catholic faith. Therefore, uh, they always was looking at me. When the, the priest came to my little town that came only once a year to celebrate the mass, he mentioned in one of his sermons that uh, the town was going through this um, time of hardship because it was under a curse because the public school have allowed the Protestant that was not baptized in the Catholic faith to attend public school. And he says that this course will continue unless they bring these young people, these young men, which was me, to be baptized. Of course, my friends with good intentions and for the sake of the people, they trying to convince me and I was not willing to go and be baptized. Uh, I already was, I knew that uh, I didn't born in that faith and I already knew very much about my Bible that uh, for that I need to believe and I didn't and I didn't believe on the baptism of, by the priest. So the discussion escalated and we ended up fighting. My nose started bleeding. So I was overpowered so they pulled me and dragged me through the street and as my knees started bleeding I told them, I said, look, you don't need to kill me. I go. As I get to the church, I remember seeing men in the right, women in the left with white bells. I remember the priest in black in the front and two young guys on white. I could smell to this time the wax of the candles. And as I approached in front, I thought, no, this is not right. I know Catholic the Catholicism is the official religion, but it's still freedom of religion, so I wouldn't let this do. So I broke from them and I started fighting and I started trying to run from them. And as I, as I got loose, I started running toward the door and I heard the priest say, let him go, let him go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. From there on, my life was uh, was not the same. So I, I, uh, I went to Lima to, to high school and I was privileged to be the first student and I was honored to that and my classmates and the faculty, they um, organized a, um, a party for me. And it was a custom that in the party they, the honorees who should toast, but it was with liquor. And I told them, I cannot do that. I am, um, so the, 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 the principal, he says, it's all right. You don't need to drink liquor. But he says, can you drink Coke? I say, yeah, that's fine. He says, well, I wish there would be more young people like you. Well, at the end of the meeting, outside my friends, they meet me and they were very disappointed how a smart guy like me could let them down. And they said, well, furthermore, we know that you haven't been baptized yet. And so they brought my religious teacher, which was a priest. They hold me down, I have a brand new suit, and they pour beer, they baptized me with beer with, to me. So this time I was very upset. So I went to the police. And the policeman, they laugh on me. He says, it's simple. Just renounce your faith, become a Catholic. We are Catholic nation. So that was the end, and I was, was looking for an opportunity to get out from there so I can continue study, and that's how I arrived here. I arrived here, I thought, man, I'm going to a Christian nation. That must be wonderful, where there is no persecution, where, the, where you can experience love at first hand. And uh, everything was fine until I was dating a white lady, a girl. Then I start noticing from my from my teachers and preachers and family, and it was just uh, very very hard to accept that. But I married her anyhow, and my I bought a house right here in Academy Street between Sunset and Academy Street, a Victorian house you probably recognize. That was my house, and the first week I arrived in there, I received a letter from the Armour Association that I was not welcome in the community, and for me to leave immediately before the property values goes down. Mm -hmm. When I looked the, who signed the letter, there were people that were going to Mineral Spring um, Methodist Church, 
and Baptist church, and I thought, how in the world is Christian people, loving people, <laughs> would not accept me in their community? Mm -hmm. So I, I started working with Hispanics, and the Hispanics started coming, and then my Hispanic friends, the Catholic church again, started coming after me because he, they thought I was destroying a culture for them. It's not only Catholicism religion, but it's also culture. So now I decided to have meetings with them, and that's how we start the Hispanic League. My time is up. I can talk to you later. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm in um, one of the a unique setting from my other panelists here tonight. I'm the chaplain at Salem Academy and College which uh, hopefully most everyone here knows is a real gem in our city and has a very unique history. The Moravian Church started Salem uh, Academy when it began in 1772. Now the Moravians are a historic peace congregation who have always believed in equality of people and trying to treat other people as if they were God's child. And this led them to educate young women and girls at a time where that was a very radical idea. And we know, unfortunately, that's still a radical idea in many parts of the world today. The Moravians have always been known for trying to view other people as equal in, um, in God's eyes. 300 years ago, there were women clergy in the Moravian congregations in Pennsylvania. They were doing interfaith work. They were interacting, engaging with synagogues in the area not as a way to convert, but as a way to learn more about their faith and interaction. Uh, missions that they had with Native Americans were also not about conversion, but as a way to interact. Now this tradition we hold very seriously at, more at Salem today, and we do have a very diverse student body. It's diverse um, racially, socioeconomically, but also religiously. I think that one of the things I love about being at Salem the most is that there is a real opportunity on a small women's campus to be able to do the kind of work that we want to do and that we're talking about tonight. Seven years ago, we started an interfaith council, uh, which many um, colleges have, and certainly Wake Forest has a very active interfaith council, which we do some things with from time to time. And this interfaith council, we have two goals. One is to help support people in their spiritual journey, no matter what it is. And secondly, to help people engage and learn about different spiritual traditions. We are able to do something at Salem that um, I believe can be a model for our society. We're in a small situation when students get to Salem and just this afternoon, I'll give you an example, and I've heard this so many times, a first year student who um, is Pentecostal and she was uh, talking about getting to know one of our Muslim students and her parents did not really were not very thrilled about that because her family had not really known anyone who was Muslim and she said you know we're in classes together she's a friend of mine and I've learned so much and there's so much I did not know about Islam you know in a small setting like that where you're in classes with everyone where people are um, you know, eating in the same cafeteria, living down the hall, or right next door to each other, they're going to be in relationship with each other, and they're going to learn about traditions different from their own. And that building relationship is the key critical thing to interfaith dialogue and fighting religious extremism. Now, one thing also that at Salem, since we're a women's college, we also deal with is we know that when a religious, religious extremism rears its head, women are normally at the forefront and get the brunt of that. Uh, I've been ordained for 25 years now. I cannot tell you how many times I've had someone say, well, you don't look like a minister. I think, what is a minister supposed to look like? Like a man. Um, or well, certainly your husband's the spiritual head of the household, right? Um, even just a few years ago, my son in high school, very progressive high school, uh, had a young woman come up to him that he didn't know and who said, um, well, I heard your mom's a minister. And he said, yeah, because he's always been proud of that. And she said, well, you know she's going to hell, don't you, because women can't be ministers. 
So I really felt sorry for her because people should not go after someone's mom, right? So it was a, a challenging thing. But it's one thing we work with our students about. Women are the ones, if not them, but other women in the world are getting the brunt of re religious extremism. And whatever we can do to help combat that is really going to make a big difference. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I'm here in place of Imam Khaled Griggs, that most folks from Winston-Salem know Imam Khaled very well. And in true Imam Khaled Griggs fashion, he called me about uh, 10 o'clock this morning <laughs> and asked me could I come and participate in a panel discussion on religious intolerance. Um, as you can see, that's not the topic. So it was in <laughs> double fashion. <laughs> he called me at 10 this morning, and then he told me it was religious intolerance. And of course, I don't have anything to do, so it was just a matter of, but no, Khaled has been a friend of mine for more than 40 years. In fact, the first lecture that I went to on Islam was at Howard University, where we were both students uh, at Howard University. This was 1972. And there was a poster on the campus that said, take your first step to freedom. Uh, come to hear a lecture on Islam. And when I went to the lecture, it was probably 1973, not 72. Khaled was one of several people there that was presenting the lecture. And it was a lecture hall about 50 times bigger than this. It's a Howard lecture hall. And for those familiar with Howard, it's Douglas Hall, which is the liberal arts building. And there was a, uh, a lecture hall with probably about 200 seats, and I was the only person uh, sitting in the lecture hall. <laughs> and after that, just to give you a little background, Khaled, I would see him as he was introducing me to Islam. I would see him from time to time in Washington at Howard, and he would always ask me, my, my non-Muslim name is Carl, my Muslim name is Lut. He would always ask me, you know, what are you waiting for to become a Muslim? And that's a whole nother story. But I just wanted to explain that uh, I didn't have a prepared statement. I was given the wrong topic. In fact, <laughs> five minutes before we started, I just texted Khaled, and I said, uh, it's religious extremism, not religious intolerance. And he texted me back and said, oops. <laughs> <laughs> now. Um, oh, we said hi. Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> I plan to go by his house when I leave to, uh, <laughs> to beat up on him. but. Um, this topic of religious uh, extremism is uh, one I can, I, I think you could imagine for many reasons why Muslims are wrestling with this on a regular basis. I, several things come to mind. Um, I always love to hear Reverend Mendez because he always gives a, a perspective that's both historical and it's political as well as being religious. And I always appreciate his perspective. I'm, I'm going to give a little perspective about Islam based on some, some history related to our prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the statement that he made. He was coming back from a battle. I don't remember the exact battle. But he was coming back from a battle, and he said to his followers, we are coming from the lesser struggle to the greater struggle. And they asked him, well, what was the greater struggle? And he said, it is the struggle with the self meaning that going onto the battlefield and having a fight against your so-called enemy was one level of struggle. But when you come home from that battle, you actually have to confront yourself individually. Um, and we have a, a saying and a principle in Islam that this is a great struggle, that it's easy to fight an enemy outside yourself, but it's much greater to fight your own enemies, your own demons within, so to speak. But I take that hadith, as we call it, and that word in Arabic means a story, or a, it's in, in Islam it's a collection of saying. I take it actually another way. One minute, okay. I take it to mean that he wasn't really talking about the battle for each individual, but he was actually talking about the battle within Islam. Not the battle with the self as my own personal battle, but the battle with other Muslims. When you come home from this fight against your so-called enemy, 
that you actually have a battle within Islam. And I think that as it relates to this subject about religious extremism, this is what Islam is engaged in now. It is a battle uh, for, as many say in the, in the uh, media and other places, it is a battle for the soul of Islam. And there are many other aspects of this battle that are very real and God willing we'll have a chance to uh, touch on uh, that are not clearly as black and white that are, have a lot of grays. So I'll just end there. I don't want to speak tonight without pausing for a moment, if we may, to honor the memory of Geneva Brown, who passed on last week. Uh, Geneva Brown had been the principal at Moore School when my daughter went there many years ago, <coughs> a longtime member of the Board of Education as well. And she was one of the people in this community whose voice and thinking were always clear and pointed on matters of tolerance and intolerance and who, uh, from my perspective, uh, did her best to be on the side of whatever, whatever angels there are. So um, we will miss her and we um, should honor her memory by trying to be like her in all of the right ways. I did want to say that um, though I am correctly identified as being the rabbi of Temple Israel in Salisbury, North Carolina. In fact, I do live in Winston-Salem. Uh, I'm, I'm not a carpetbagger. Well, I am a carpetbagger, but um, and, uh, in, in this instance, um, I really do live in the city, um, also known as Pofftown, by the way, um, d d depending on which side of the divide you're on. I grew up, however, being a carpetbagger, I grew up in Newark, Ju New Jersey in a community in which white Protestants were in short supply. Uh, it was a largely, though not exclusively, Jewish neighborhood in which we had also uh, a significant uh, African-American population. We had African-American Catholics and Af African-American Protestants. We had white Catholics of a, a broad range of backgrounds. Polish, German, Italian, um, Hispanic, et, et, et cetera, uh, Portuguese, uh, all over the map. Within the Jewish community, we had um, a very broad spectrum of Jewish practice and beliefs. One reason why I say this is that one of the benefits of my growing up in that kind of environment and going to a public school in that sort of environment was that none of the stereotypes made sense when you came out of that kind of experience. Because you had seen and gone to school with on a day-to-day -day basis people from a variety of backgrounds, a variety of colors, a variety of national heritages, and you discovered that, no, they, they are, in fact, not all like that. In, in fact, the, the Jewish kids in my class and their parents were vastly dissimilar from one another. That was part of the interesting negotiation that took place in that kind of setting. Well, what do you, what do, you do? How do you practice? Where do you go to synagogue or don't go to synagogue? What do you do or, or, or don't do? Do you go to school on these religious holidays or not go to school on these religious holidays? What do you eat or don't eat and with whom and in what, co in what combinations? It was an important experience in the formation of my sense of the cultural richness and diversity of American life. <coughs> Unfortunately, we all know of people who want to hold on to the vision of their very narrow experience. And they would love for it to be 
become coercive. Religion is only one of the ways, one of the tools in which that coercive attitude becomes oppressive and repressive, such that people feel, and unfortunately we are in a legal and legislative climate in which they have every reason to feel that because something someone wants to do offends them, or someone else's background or religious practice offends them, that they should have the right and the ability to repress it. This conversation that we are in is a very important one, and I think lots of us have lots of overlapping parts of our stories. So we, we want to use our remaining time wisely and um, engage around some of the questions um, that um, you are providing to us. And so I encourage you to keep writing your questions. We won't get to all of them. Um, and uh, Jamie, feel free to bring those up uh, as, as you have them. Um, sometimes the questions are actually more important than any answers that we give. And so um, your, your part in this is really important. So I want to begin with a question to the entire uh, panel. That doesn't mean everybody has to answer it, but it's, it's for everyone to consider. Are there particular religious doctrines, theologies, um, religious practices more apt to inspire hatred and extremism uh, than others? Let me say that again. Are there particular religious doctrines, and you can speak from your faith tradition or as you perceive that in others, particular doctrines, theologies, religious practices um, more apt to inspire hatred and extremism than others. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Let me respond to that, and I'm glad you asked that. I was just thinking about that <laughs> in terms of, um, I'm going to go back to something that Sigmund Freud um, reflected upon in terms of how God is perceived um, in terms of um, being a projected um, image out of, again, when we talk about um, a particular worldview and theology. And so much of what we're talking about uh, right now, I think, is predicated on um, how we understand God and we use God in many ways to defend our causes. Um, in contemporary thinking about God, um, particularly I'm thinking in terms of Alfred North Whitehead uh, process uh, philosophy, um, where there's a move from God being coercive to God being persuasive. And it, it, it makes the difference in terms of um, how, in fact, we engage each other and, um, again, begin to work toward community. And this particular theological perspective recognizes the interrelatedness, again, of all life, but also of all human beings. Um, one of the things that runs through fundamentalism is this idea of coercion. Uh, domination and um, what many of the panelists refer to as this imposition, imposing on others a certain um, belief system and whatnot. And again, it flows from God being coercive, the individualism, and um, this self-interest um, as opposed to what Dr. King talked about and his idea of the beloved community, which again is predicated on uh, this mutuality. Um, and what affects one directly affects all of us indirectly. So I would say yes, but I think we have to name the demons that in fact um, cause this kind of oppression and, and domination uh, versus people trying to work together um, with a view of God, regardless of what the religion may be, that emphasizes God's persuasive and more kind, gentle 
uh, relationship with the world. I would want to add to that that it uh, seems to me that one of those demons is the othering mm. of people, groups of people, that takes place frequently when any religion seeks to de define itself in terms of those who are within and those who are outside. Because those who are outside are often regarded not simply as uh, potential visitors, <laughs> A potential people to be welcomed in, whether for a brief time or permanently, but instead as outside the fold. And therefore, they are either enemies or they are people to be yanked into the fold by being grabbed physically or grabbed in, in, in some coercive way and hauled in, in you know, oppressively. And I would like to add also that another uh, common denominator is um, when sacred writings are seen as idols, are held up as not as a tool on a, a spiritual journey or as divinely inspired, but which are held up as idols themselves which cannot be touched in any way, uh, especially sacred writings which do have uh, violence represented in them. And the sacred writing which has by far the most uh, actions of violence is the Christian Bible, which is from my own tradition. So that's a, a real issue I think we deal with. And I like to add from the Hispanic perspective. It might not fit the English speaking people, but with the Hispanics there is groups that are really, uh, we have to be very careful, especially the Holiness groups. I visited mm -hmm. Mexico in a missionary trip and I saw, I couldn't believe my eyes, in a banner from, from one side of the street to the another side of the street, and in front of Holiness Church, and says, and this church would not accept women that wear pants. I said, wow. <laughs> well, I arrived in here, and these groups are in here in the United States, too. So they've been uh, telling my people that your pastor is a false prophet because he doesn't speak in tongues. Yeah. And your people will go to hell because you accept women wearing pants in your church. <coughs> and so sometimes, you know, uh, we look at the Islamic extremists and fundamentalists, but we, we tend to just um, put binoculars, high power binoculars, to look uh, somewhere else. But I would like for a moment you take those high power binoculars and put some wide angle, mm -hmm. and you will see around you that there is some hate message that we portray in some way or another. And then within the same, I, when uh, Perry Shimon died, I couldn't believe a preacher, he put on Facebook, he says, I'm so sad that he's in hell today because he did not accept Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we, we have our, in our own churches, right. we have messages in there, and then I have from the, um, not only from the, uh, from the holiness extremists, which I call them, because they try and portray that they think that they, they got God in their hands and the Holy Spirit, and, and those that we don't participate, we go to hell. Right. And so, the, and, and they can instill on some sick mind some, to take some actions later, and I think, and that's why I feel that we need to learn how to respect other faiths, their deities, and their holy books, and do what Jesus says, do unto others as you want them to do unto you. Uh, I think the answer that quest to that question are, are some religious doctrines and religious practices more apt to inspire hatred and extremism. The answer is absolutely yes. Yeah. Practically all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Muslims have a real problem when they come to America or they go to any other non-Muslim country. For example, you know, recent examples in uh, France with the, uh, the attack on the uh, cartoonists. Well, they, when they come from predominantly Muslim environments, they're not used to any aspect of Islam being criticized. And they're certainly not uh, used to any kind of depiction of the prophet uh, being some uh, some act of defamation or something like that. So they have a real, very hard time. And this is not just Muslims from a religious standpoint, but even culturally. 
I have the masjid in Greensboro that I attend, the Islamic Center of Greensboro, has a, probably a 90% uh, population or, or those who frequent the masjid are from Africa, from uh, Niger, from Sudan. Uh, these are primarily Muslim countries. And they have, some of them have been here 20, 30 years. They've lived in various parts of the country and they have a real hard time understanding American culture. They have a real hard time understanding any culture of, other than their own because within Islam, there are thousands of cultures. And the, the um, Yoruba Muslim culture is different from the, from the um, uh, as I'm thinking because my, my wife teaches uh, uh, students. He's from the Ivory Coast, but he came, he said, I've been in America 25 years and I still don't understand it because it's different than Yoruba culture. He said in his culture, uh, the father never disciplines the child. It's the uncle who does that. Mm. So I had to sit there and try to figure out, oh, really, what does the father do? But he went on to explain to me, he said, I've been in America this long. So I think what happens for Muslims, they go to a place like France, where satire is probably at the highest level. They think it is the greatest enemy and attack on Islam for them to do that because they don't live in a country like America where Jesus has been depicted in every negative way possible. Somebody just showed me a picture yesterday of Jesus on a on the cross on a surfboard. You know, so I mean you know, this is part of the question was are there doctrines that, enco that encourage or create hatred? Absolutely. Absolutely, and I think it's very. I think it's a blessing for me to be a Muslim in America, because I'm not, uh, in a sense, I'm not subject to those kinds of uh, ideas that somebody should be killed because they made a cartoon about the Prophet. But for many Muslims, it's like the worst thing you could possibly do, because of their lack of exposure to uh, anything outside of their own cultural or religious experience. So I want to get at another question um, and again I appreciate uh, these are really intelligent questions that you're asking um, the question is given that extremism uh, is uh, makes up a small percentage of every faith tradition what is it going to take to move the narrative away from the extreme read that again given that extremism makes up a small percentage of every faith tradition what is it going to take to move the narrative away from the extreme? I like to say that um, many people or many religions do this because ignorance, um, and they don't know. But I think we s it's our mission to teach them and through interaction. Uh, many years ago, when I was being uh, attacked and I felt that, uh, that I was getting attacked from different angles, so I decided to have some uh, interaction with this preacher, especially with the people that were against me, so I developed the, the friendship games. And so we brought those preachers together to play together and to eat together so that way we can know each other that we uh, believe in the same God. And we are trying to bring God to men and men to God. So we are in the same business. So why are we fighting? <laughs> okay. So that kind of work. And then I thought, hmm, this is work. So this time, later, I decided to do something else. We, did, we brought the Abrahamic religions together. It was a privilege for five years. We had the Peace Cup Games in my church. We brought the Islam, Nation of Islam from Greensboro, Brother uh, uh, William Muhammad, you might know him, and uh, also from here, from uh, Winston Salem, and also I brought the <coughs> the Jewish people. That was we had them. Um, I had the privilege to know the. Um, it, it's the um, in uh, a Jewish community in, in Kernersville they were meeting. They were very hard to come, but they came, and then the Christians to play together, and we learned that we are the same people families, that we love God, and it was beautiful, and now, right now, I'm trying to organize, I have, I already spoke to the policeman, and we will have a 
games with the police department so we can, the police can know us and we want to know them and we want to cook for them. And after that, I already scheduled to have um, uh, some games and some meetings and some music with the Filipino church from Greensboro, the Laotian church from uh, High Point, um, and also Brother Mahoman, he will, he will be there. And also, um, I want uh, an African-American church, Anglo church, and a Spanish church to be all together. And this is different denominations. I think interaction is important because through interaction, we can learn. And we can learn to respect others, respect the religion, respect their, I mean, I might not agree with you, but at least let me respect you. Let me respect for what you stand, what you believe. I wonder if it would be fair to say that one of the common themes I'm hearing up here from our panelists um, is that um, um, weighing into um, uh, religious uh, dialogue and conversation um, is not nearly as complicated as, as, as it seems sometimes. Sometimes as simple as is, um, being fearless enough and courageous enough to expand your circle of friends. And um, most of us actually know how to do that inherently. And so um, I was hearing that from you as you were explaining that. I believe yeah. you were going to yeah, respond. I think people, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I think people of a more <coughs> generous spirit in each religious tradition need to pick up more responsibility for taking over the, uh, uh, the, the dialogue about what that religious tradition means rather than allowing it to be controlled by the expressions of physical expressions and, and verbal expressions of those who are the most rigid and the least tolerant. Yeah, and I was going to say, in, in looking at recent facts or recent events, let's say like the movie Selma, I don't know how many people have seen Selma, uh, and depicting something that happened 50 years ago, uh, where extreme I guess you call them political views or racial views, were quite popular. Uh, lynchings used to occur, and there would be large crowds uh, cheering the lynchings on, and the local newspaper, the Winston-Salem Journal, if we were referring to that, would be covering it like a news event. <clears throat> and they would show the person being hung and his body being burned, sometimes his sexual organs being mutilated, and this was not uh, considered extreme at one time. It was mainstream at one time. Fortunately, that's not the case today. Um, I guess a combination of uh, laws, a uh, combination of uh, the evolution of the society in some sense has uh, marginalized what at one time was known as the KKK. The KKK used to be the city council or the citizens council if you were down south somewhere. Um, and fortunately in the south in places like Selma and all over the deep south where these kinds of things used to occur that were considered not extreme but mainstream, a lot of that has changed or at least it has gone underground even though I think it's resurfacing to some degree now. And I think the same thing has to happen there has to be a battle to marginalize, uh, whether it be in Islam or any other religion, or any other religion, to marginalize those, those people and uh, their religious and political views that attempt to basically hijack the religion or hijack, hijack the, uh, the discourse. As I think is happening to some degree in America right now, there's a, there's a serious, I think, uh, turning of America back to the right, so to speak, that, uh, that has to be fought, which will lead to uh, renewed uh, incidences of, uh, which, which, as you well know, we're already seeing of uh, extremism and intolerance and those kinds of things. So I think it has to be a collective that we all try to marginalize them. Unfortunately, sometimes they have to be defeated, not only at the ballot box, but in other places as well. So, so we, we have time for about two more questions. And, and so this question I'd like as many of you to just weigh in on briefly, if you would. As um, religious leaders within the community, uh, 
do you, do your communities that you represent, bear any responsibility for misdeeds carried out in the name of your faith tradition? If so, what would that be? Within your faith community, do you, do you bear any responsibility for misdeeds carried out in the name of your religious or faith tradition? Would you be referring to uh, locally, amongst in our community? Certainly, or? certainly could be. It yeah. certainly could be close to home. Well, certainly, it's very difficult for any Muslim to take responsibility for acts that happen, uh, certainly internationally. Um, uh, I, there are very, very few acts of uh, extremism by Muslims in, on, on any kind of local basis. Um, there are a few in the state of North Carolina, a few throughout the country, in a lot of cases. These are young Muslims who, and many times poor, uneducated. Sometimes they are uh, educated. Uh, in, in most cases, they've been immigrants to this country. Um, like, for example, the Boston Marathon and those kinds of uh, events. Um, most Muslim communities, even in Boston, will tell you that these people were not associated with the masjid. They didn't come. They may have come to the masjid once or twice, but they weren't active members of the masjid. So I don't think, in, a, in one sense, we don't bear responsibility. In another sense, as Islam is not something that's just local, it is uh, international. Uh, we do feel a sense of responsibility anytime those things happen, uh, but not in the sense that we have the ability to stop someone from being radicalized and uh, becoming a, an extremist. Uh, I've been a Muslim for 40 years, and I know very few of them who have committed, very few of any who've committed those kinds of acts. And if there are a lot of uh, historical, political, uh, um, territorial, regional things that go on that we really have nothing to do with and know very little about. So it's very difficult to take responsibility for them in that sense. I think one thing that <clears throat> we have a responsibility to do is um, you know, to lift our voice from within our own traditions mm -hmm. and to di differentiate ourselves within our own tradition. I mean, one of the things that I, I think is important to to consider is how we are perceived by other people. So there are fine distinctions within, you know, evangelical Protestantism and Christianity, and we may all understand those, but in larger circles and communities, we may be viewed more monolithically. And so I, I think it's important when things happen that we not um, simply uh, remain silent. It's the silence of good people that uh, or generous people, as you were saying earlier, that, that you know, allows uh, the narrative, if you will, to go forward. And so I think you know, one responsibility we do have, while we might not be responsible directly for the action that another person does, we bear a responsibility to speak and to act differently and in a differentiated manner so that people who are wondering, well, are all Baptists like that? Well, maybe they need to know that the answer to that is no. They're, we're not all like that. Uh, there may be some, perhaps in some cases a majority, who might be one way or another, but let's differentiate ourselves in the public square enough so that uh, the community has a, uh, a better sense, particularly the community that may not be you know, immersed in that particular tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to speak from within uh, to uh, persons who do not necessarily dwell therein with us so they can have a, a more uh, clear um, sense of, of, of what some of the differences may be. Uh, otherwise, I think we just, uh, you know, we do. We just capitulate and, and, and take cover in silence. And, yes, and that is, uh, that's a... You know that's a damning thing for us. And also, I'd like to add that I think every religious leader bears responsibility in the way he presents his message, because I hear some preachers that the time they spend only attacking other religious, other ministers. So indirectly, they are putting the seed 
on those miners, these hate seeds. And I told many, many times to my people, when they come, they say, can we accept gays in our church? I say, look, I say, first of all, I say, the doors are open for everybody. And God didn't call me to be a judge. That's up to him. He called me to be a witness, and that's what I will do. And we just will preach God and nothing else. I'm not interested in your ministry, your ministry, so I don't need to talk about your ministry. <laughs> okay, God didn't call me for that. And so in that sense, I think the ministers, we bear responsibility the way we present the message because we are planting seeds and there's so many weak minds in there that they can talk and uh, they can take it in the, in the wrong way. Last, last question. Um, I really appreciate the fact that we have a lot of um, young adults or as Christian Smith and Notre Dame says, emerging adults in the room and I appreciate you being here. So my question for the panelists is sensible recommendations that you would have for the young people sitting in this room as they look at what is as of to date the 21st century's most serious challenge to peace in the world. Would you have sensible recommendations uh, to the young people sitting in the room? I would ask that question differently and that is I think the young people need to talk to us. I was at the march a few uh, months ago in D.C. Must have been over 100,000 people out there in response to Ferguson and other um, incidents. And I saw young, black, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, um, uh, whites, etc., marching together, mostly young people out there, almost two-thirds. And when I saw whites, carrying signs saying black life matters um, and they taking the lead in this I think we have to hear them and I personally am involved you talked about that inner struggle in terms of being a product of the civil rights movement um, going all the way back to the 60s to where I am now um, I have to challenge myself in terms of um, how my experiences have shaped my thinking and um, and to in, and I'm engaging um, they're helping me to move beyond certain uh, prejudices that I experienced and em that emerged within my own thinking as a result of all of those past experiences how we understand uh, the world so I think you know and I tell young people all the time now that um, I'm ready to follow them. I'm ready for them uh, to take this lead. Their experiences are different. Um, and I think they represent that paradigm that I was talking about earlier, that new paradigm. Um, and uh, so I, I think that's important. The other thing is I wanted to say earlier is that um, the tone sort of uh, sounds like the most violent people are the Muslims. <laughs> and the media focus focuses terribly, you know, on that. But some of the most violent people in America are Christians. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to acknowledge that. Your experiences are my experiences. I remember when uh, Rabbi Leapshoot was here, and you probably remember um, the religious Ku Klux Klan and all of them that were marching down the streets and I convinced the rabbi we needed to unite and, and, and go to, into the streets together to challenge them. Andrew was there, you know, and others um, and whatnot. But the violence um, that comes from Christians and mainly white Christians, African-American ministers and pastors may not engage in a lot of violence physically, but they engage in a lot of violence with the attacks on women gays and lesbians, as well as with the influence of the prosperity gospel now uh, that permeates the church. Um, and I think, you know, we have to speak out, you know, um, about that, which means that um, the call is to be, and I love um, Rabbi Abraham uh, Heschel in terms of the pathos of God, um, be, being sensitive to the pain uh, within God because that pain represents 
all of the suffering and hurting people that's um, in this world and in this community. And I think if we take Jesus' uh, love ethic seriously um, and hear the voices of the prophets, then we have to look at um, our ministries, what we do, in terms of an alternative to what is right now, the creation of a new sense of consciousness. And I see that emerging with um, our young people, and I'm trying to you know, get with them uh, to feel their experiences um, that is transforming to myself. I'd like to, to add too with emerging adults, I think there's two things that are really critical. One is relationship, the second is education. Um, and I witness this every day at Salem, and I'm so grateful for that. But building relationships, being in community with people who come from different faith traditions, realizing there's a lot of diversity in every faith tradition. Our Muslim students at Salem practice their faith in a number of different ways. But being in relationship, building community, learning from each other, and then education. Um, getting rid of a lot of these misconceptions that are out there that we hear in the media constantly, really trying to know the information. One thing I would like to see with emerging adults is um, having a required class about world religions. You know, I have just had my younger child get through uh, the public school system who's graduating this year, and the only thing she got in public school was a little bit from her AP world history, about a little bit of history of the world religions. This is one of the key critical issues of our age, and we should be educating our young children about these different religions, their history, cultures, beliefs, practices in the world today, and how people can engage across religious difference. And I'd agree with Amy and John. I would say to the emerging um, adults <clears throat> in the language they probably understand, don't believe the hype. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, because the hype, uh, depending upon what, what hype you are watching and listening to, can really uh, fool you and can make you think that things are one way when they are another, particularly about Islam. Because, and listen, since, since 2001, uh, Muslims have been invited to more churches, to more synagogues, to more, uh, I mean, it was a time <coughs> at, when I was in this position at the Islamic Center of Greensboro, literally every week for a year, almost two years, we were speaking at a church, Sunday school, Boy Scout troops, all these kinds of things, pri primarily to uh, to give a counter narrative to the to the uh, perception that Muslims were uh, only interested in killing people and bombing places and so forth and so on. So uh, that's what I would say. Don't believe the hype. That's a public enemy uh, <laughs> song for those who don't. For those who are not yep. those who've already emerged as adult. <laughs> that's a public so, enemy song. So, so yeah. please join me in uh, offering our appreciation to our panelists this evening. And thank you, uh, audience, for your good questions uh, and for being here. Um, uh, we are small in number, but it's amazing what form a teachable moment will take. Uh, and, uh, and this moment will change our trajectories as we leave here. And uh, Wanda, do you want to, I see you waving back there. I'm going to put you on the spot and let you speak to what I'm just passing around to our, our panelists. Thank you, Commissioner Amon. Let's give Commissioner Amon a round of applause for doing an outstanding job moderating, as always. Um, everyone in the audience should have received <clears throat> one of these Everyone Matters Day stickers. And this is an initiative that we're doing with several community partners, with Interfaith Winston-Salem, who's here tonight, with the Hispanic League, with the Winston-Salem Urban League Young Professionals, with Winston-Salem Under 40, with the Chamber of Commerce, um, several community <coughs> partners we're working with on this. And so I'd just like to acknowledge those partners, and this is an initiative of the Human Relations Commission, and the College Advisory Board and Youth Council are doing this as well. So this is in response to something Reverend Mendez said earlier, and I'm glad he said it because it prompted me to remember these stickers. What we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage our community to understand and know that everyone matters. Certainly black lives matter, 
Hispanic lives matter, white lives matter, everyone matters. And so we're working with the mayor's office on pushing this initiative. Mayor Joins has some of these stickers as well in his office. And we want the community to really come together on, on this, which is something that's happening on April the 2nd. It's a national initiative. And so uh, communities from all over the United States and even um, overseas in London and places like that, April 2nd, will all be acknowledging this. So I encourage you to take some extra stickers if you'd like to share them with your congregants, friends, family members, and so on. We'll be happy to share with you. So again, this is a great tie-in with what we've been talking about tonight. We want to educate our community. We want everyone to understand that we are all alike. We're more alike than we are dissimilar. Just as Reverend Bocanegra said, I couldn't say it more eloquently than he did, certainly. But I think that's something that is worthy to keep in mind as we move forward. And again, tonight was scratching the surface. I hope you did learn a few things, though, especially younger people here in the audience. And um, certainly, this may be something that will continue in the future, having this dialogue. But we're happy that you joined us this evening. Thank you for, yes, your highly intelligent questions. Thank you, um, uh, panel, for your, your riveting and personal stories. Thank you for your expertise. You are second to none. This is a real um, first class panel. So we're really fortunate and blessed to have them with us tonight. And again, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.